All right, join with me this morning. We're going to jump into uh, the story of Balaam and Numbers chapter 22. So the text will be up on the screen. We're starting in verse 2. Uh, otherwise, feel free to, to uh, follow along in your Bible as well. So. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. So Moab was in great fear because of the people, for they were numerous. And Moab was in dread of the sons of Israel. Moab said to the elders of Midian, Now this horde will eat us, eat up all that is around us, as the ox eats up all the grass of the field. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of Moab at the time. So he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor, at Pethor, which is near the Euphrates River, in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Behold, a people came out of Egypt. Behold, they have covered the surface of the land, and they are living opposite me. Now therefore, please come, curse this people for me, since they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I will be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that he whom, bless, whom you bless is blessed, and he whom you curse is cursed. So the elders of Moab and the elders of Midian left with the thieves for divination in their hands. And they came to Balaam and repeated Balak's words to him. And he said to them, Spend the night here, and I will bring word back to you just as the Lord may speak to me. And the leaders of Moab stayed with Balaam. Then God came to Balaam and said, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak the son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent word to me. Behold, there is a person who came out of Egypt, and they cover the surface of the land. Now come, curse them for me. Perhaps I will be able to fight against them and drive them out. But God said to Balaam, Do not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. So Balaam got up in the morning and said to Balak's representatives, Go back to your land, for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. And the representatives from Moab got up and went to Balak and said, Balaam refused to come with us. Then Balak sent representatives once again, more numerous and more distinguished than the previous. They came to Balaam and said to him, this is what Balak, the son of Zippor, says, I beg you, let nothing keep you from coming to me, for I will indeed honor you richly, and I will do whatever you tell me. Please come then, curse this people. But Balaam replied to the servants of Balak, Even if Balak were to give me his house full of silver and gold, I could not do anything, either small or great, contrary to the command of the Lord my God. Now please, you also stay here tonight, and I will find out what else the Lord will say to me. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men have come to call you, rise and go with them, but you shall do only the things that I tell you. So Balaam arose in the morning, saddled his donkey, and went with the leaders of Moab. My sermon in a sentence this morning is this. Put to death the desires of our earthly nature or be consumed by them. Now let's take a moment here and observe some facts of this account so that we can better learn who Balaam was. And so what we know coming up to this is that the children of Israel had pitched their tents near the plains of Moab, right by, the, by Jericho. And as we read, it said Balak was the king of Moab. Now his people had heard about the Israelites, how many there were, and about the casualties that they had just inflicted on the Amorites. If you look right prior to this story, that's what you'll read. So they were afraid. So Balak, Balak conjures up this plan that instead of trying to uh, address the people either head on or in some kind of a, uh, a, uh, of a treaty, he sends a message to Balaam. He wants him to come and to curse the Israelites. 
Now, you may not realize this, but the leaders that traveled would have traveled over 400 miles one way to bring the message to Balaam. That specific message was, anyone you bless will be blessed, but anyone you curse will fail. And we also read a very convenient fact that they took money with them. This trip would have taken them several weeks each way. Before answering the messenger, so as after they've arrived, notice that Balaam first, first consults with God. And we read again what God said. You shall not go with them. You shall not curse the people, for they are blessed. Balaam listens to God and sends them back to Balak. My first point this morning is this. When God gives an answer, listen to it the first time, the second time, every time. However, Balak doesn't give up. He decides to send a larger and more distinguished delegation in attempt to appeal to Balaam. He sends this larger group, essentially offering a blank check. We learn later on in 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 15 and 16, that Balaam loved making money regardless of what had to be done to receive it. Here are the words in the passage. Peter wrote, they have he's speaking, by the way, to false prophets. He says, they have forsaken the right way and, have, and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, who loved the wages of righteousness. God has very clearly already said, said to him, don't go. Balaam should have sent them the second time right away. He shouldn't have needed to go and have them spend the night or consult with God. He should have said, I've already gotten my answer. You've already heard it. Turn and go home. But then he says something kind of peculiar there. He says, I won't come even if you offer me a house full of silver and gold. It's as though he's naming his price. He tells the messengers, stay a night, and let me stop and consult and see if God has anything else to say. He's just opened the door to this, you know, maybe God's going to give me something different this time, because now I have a more ingrained, or a more of a desire to go, because the, the uh, benefits are increasing. Clearly, what we read in the story uh, and what we read through the passage I read in, P in 2 Peter, Balak's increased offer of nobility and finances appeals to Balaam. He desires to go with them, mainly for the, for the purpose of lining his pockets. He doesn't care about what happens or what he does to earn it. He just wants the money. Now, God tells Balaam to go, but to do only what he has said. So Balaam gets up and saddles his donkey. And he goes with the princes of Moab. Now in Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, we read, Simply let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more comes from the evil one. Now there's an expression. Everyone has a price. It's a matter of figuring out what that price is. For Balaam, it was the clinking of coins that dictated his decision-making. It may not be money for you, but what is it in this life that guides your decision-making process? Is there something, is there anything that if it was given to you in enough abundance, that you would be willing to cast off your principles because the offer was just too good to refuse. 
If the answer to that is yes, I think we've located an idol. Secondly, covetousness blinds us to the things that even a fool can see. Now, shortly after Balaam leaves, we read that God was angry that Balaam had gone. He decides to send a message that would not soon be forgotten. One of the Lord's angels stood in the road to block his way. The donkey, an animal known for being foolish, saw the angel standing there with a sword. But Balaam could not see it. So donkey, the donkey went off the road and into an open field. Balaam beat the donkey to get it back on the road. Next, the angel stood in a path between two walls. When he saw, the donkey saw the angel this time, it walked so close to the wall that it crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And so Balaam hit her again. Then the angel moved one more time and stood in a spot so narrow that there was no room for the donkey to go around. So she just lay down. Balaam's anger was kindled, and he hit the donkey with his staff. Now, I can't help, when I read this, I couldn't help but chuckle a little bit about what's going on here and what those other people that were traveling with Balaam must have been thinking. No doubt, Balaam felt a bit foolish at being unable to control his donkey. Even as things seemed normal to everyone else. It never ceases to amaze me how the human race, and that's all of the human race, none of us are exempt from this, that we seem to have amazing 2020 vision about the errors or the issues or the problems that we see in other people's lives. But we struggle to see anything foolish in our own behavior. Why is this? I think it's largely because when idols are present in our lives, when there's something that we want, something that we've even convinced ourselves that we deserve, we'll do whatever it takes to get it. This is, there's a spiritual blindness there. Now, when someone is blind, until they, you know, they need something, either someone or something to help them be guided. They need someone, you know, when there's an obstacle in their path, they need the use of either the stick or another person to guide them around that. And let me just say that we would all agree that in that instance, that the person that is near them would be unloving if they just disregarded it and said, good luck. I know you're blind, but no big deal. You know, they'll, they'll get up and they'll, they'll grow from this. Or good riddance. Right? We all know that we would help them out and say, you know, just either move the item if we could or say, hey, take a couple steps to the right and, and so forth. Do we do that with, when it comes to spiritual blindness? We all have this. We are all in the same boat. The issue that we're blind to may be different, but we are all spiritually blind to something or things. And when you're in that state, in that area, whatever that region of your life is, you are choosing to be separate from God. You've chosen whatever it is you're idolizing over God. And because you're blind to it, you don't know any better, you're really lying to yourself and you just continue down the path. This is what I deserve. We hear this language a lot, especially in our culture. Watch a commercial and just about everyone you watch will say, you deserve this or something to that nature. 
That, that message pulls on man's heartstrings. And so even when we see the torment, you know, maybe you've even experienced, this is part of the reason that I love the idea of the testimony time where we can share where God has, is working. This is the part of the testimony. You know, this is what I've experienced. God is, God is telling me to share this because I don't know who needs to hear it, but somebody might need to hear it. You know, I've had, I had a really difficult day at work. You know, maybe Betsy has no idea who needed to hear that, but someone probably needed to hear that. And maybe someone else needed to hear the, man, let me think about what other people are going through, and maybe I didn't cause it. I'm not a, but how can I aid in the process of helping lighten their day? How can I be a gift? How can I be... Be present to what's going on in their lives. But even when someone when someone is in this blind, spiritually blind state, even when the torment is tangible, they, they know what could result, uh, we are often uh, unable to fully comprehend it. We often, we, we get our minds focused on something, Whatever that something is for you, and we just dive in. Now, Jesus came into the world in judgment so that those who don't see could see, and those that, don't, that could see become blind. This is an amazing insight into humans who live in the flesh and how we see things so differently than what God does. If we were to look around us right now and view what's going on in our world as normal, if anybody thinks that, then, then I think it's time to reassess our relationship with Jesus. If we witness people going to other people and saying, hey, you know what, I got an issue here, and I'm going to go gossip about it over here, and we partake in that, or we we do nothing to help point back to the source, there's an example of how we, uh, we want to make things easy. We don't want to deal with those things and say, you know what, we need to stop here, pause, and address whatever the issue is at hand. Because God sees things differently than we do. We want things, we want our relationships to be as easy, as comfortable as possible, God wants deep, loving uh, relationships where we can speak into one another's lives in love. You see, when Jesus is present in our lives, he promised to transform us. We heard that in one of our passages this morning. By the renewing of our mind. So that we can take captive every thought in order to do what? To make those thoughts obedient to God. Now sometimes God uses unexpected circumstances to make us see what is really there. He certainly did with Balaam. So, in this most amazing moment, God caused Balaam's donkey to talk. Interestingly enough, it didn't seem to shake Balaam all that much. I can't imagine having my, a donkey talk to me and you know, I'd probably think I was a little crazy. But the donkey asked Balaam, What have I done to you to make you beat me three times? And Balaam responded, It is because you have made a mockery of me. If only there had been a sword in my hand, for I would have killed you by now. The donkey told Balaam that he was her owner. I'm sorry, Balaam told the donkey that he was her owner. I got that backwards there. Uh, and that he had ridden upon her many times. And then the, the donkey asked Balaam if she had ever done anything to deserve the hitting that he had just done before. And he said no. And so the donkey says, 
God allowed me to see the angel. And at that moment, Balaam's eyes are opened to seeing that which he had not previously been able to see. And suddenly he realized the donkey was attempting to save his life. So Balaam continues on and he shows up to Balak and he says, I will say only that which God has told me to say. We all have blind spots. And those are the places we need people who are willingly and lovingly able to speak into our lives. If you've gone through that process of having people speak into your lives, and I have many times, it can feel like you're being mocked. It can feel like it's, uh, you wish you didn't have to go through it. Wouldn't life just be nice and easy if we could just all always be positive with one another, if we could just always say affirming things and just let people live how they wanted to and never get into the grind and the mess, the sin? Man, that sure would be positive, right? But when you come out on the other side of it, you realize that there's a newness to life. And that you would not have experienced this newness if you hadn't gone through the, experience, through the tough times, the, the difficult conversation. We need one another. Finally, evil presents itself on multiple fronts, seeking to destroy our fellowship with God. And I'm sorry, I, I, I have to admit I made a mistake here. This isn't my final point. There's one more. But, so shortly after arriving... Balaam is taken by Balak to three different locations. And there, uh, Balaam wants him to uh, destroy the fellowship by cursing the Israelite camp. But God won't allow it. Every time Balaam attempts to curse, God causes him to bless the Israelites. And as a result, Balak refuses to pay Balaam any money. And so, even though we don't get the full context here, you miss something if you don't consider what's written about Balaam later, we understand that at this point, Balaam realizes he's not going to get any money unless he changes his tactic. So he shifts gears and proposes a different method to destroy the fellowship with God. Again, if you just read through the numbers account, you don't you don't understand the gravity. You get this transition into chapter 25. It's like, wait a second here. What just happened? Is Balaam gone? Where, where is he in this? But at the beginning of chapter 25, we read the Israelite men began to indulge in sexual immorality with the Moabite women who invited them to, to the sacrifices to their gods. The people ate the sacrificial meal and bowed down before these gods. So Israel yoked themselves to Baal. And the Lord's anger burned against them. Now later on in Numbers chapter 31, it is revealed to us that Balaam caused Israel to commit trespass against the Lord here. And that there was a plague among the congregation. The work of Balaam caused the children of Israel Israel to sin and suffer a terrible plague. Jesus later on recalled how Balaam, in his words, Revelation, this is in Revelation chapter 2, kept teaching Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel by causing them to eat food they had been offered to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians, Balaam could have helped the Moabites and others too, in Paul's words, turn from idols to instead serve the living and true God. However, Balaam failed miserably as a prophet. He wanted to curse God's people in order to obtain the money that was offered to him. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which, which caused many sorrows. Balaam was so overcome by the worldliness 
that his values did not reflect righteousness. He knew what God expected, but he tried to find happiness in the world. And finally, God often uses the unexpected to push forward his plan. Now, reading this story, I can't help but think about all the unexpected characteristics that occurred around the birth of Jesus. I also can't help but think about the unexpected nature of, that we find in Nathaniel's words in John chapter 1, verse 46. He said, can any, any good be found or come from Nazareth? You see, in those instances, there were pre-set assumptions or presumptions about Nazareth and also about how God would choose to work through his Messiah. Now, why am I bringing this story up now? What does this have to do with today? And I would say this, we all presume things about people, locations, and even, at times, ourselves. For example, the phrase that came to my mind was this, God could never use fill-in-the-blank person, place, or thing because of where they're from, or what their family has done, or what baggage they have in their life. No one expected God to use David to slay Goliath, but he did. Similarly, understanding what we have seen about Balaam and what the rest of Scripture says, we might be inclined to say, can anything good come from Balaam? Can God really use evil to point towards good? Before Balaam leaves, he shares four additional messages. In one of them, Balaam says this, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. He will crush the foreheads of Moab, the skulls of all the people of Sheth. Edom will be conquered. Seir, his enemy, will be conquered. But Israel will grow strong. A ruler will come out of Jacob and destroy the survivors of the city. He's prophesying about Christ. God has given us the gift of discernment through the Holy Spirit. It was intended to help us through this journey through life, to determine what is truth and what is not. I'm going to step away from my notes here for just a second to say one of the things that I have witnessed in our world, um, and it plagues our world much more than it does our churches, but how often we want to paint things as black and white. And that, can you believe what so-and-so said or did? And we want to just toss everything out that they've ever done and said and say there's no value there. Can you believe they believe this or they said this? Can we really rely on anything that they've ever said or done? Or we hear somebody profess something, some great truth and we think, oh, man, this person knows, they know what they're talking about. And so we start consuming it. Without discernment. That's the key. Discernment. The gift of the Spirit is that we have the ability to discern what is right and what is wrong. And oftentimes, and I have experienced this so many times in my own life, the truth that we need to hear often comes from the place we least expect it. And we rarely look for it. So be, be sensitive to how God is speaking into your life. Be willing to share how God is. Sorry, Betsy, I'm going to use you again as an example. But, uh, but be willing to share vulnerably, really, about how you had a difficult week. And, and to know that um, some ways to get to the other side is blessing one another being there for one another. And so we are reminded that as we
proceed forward in this life, in our daily journey. It is so vital to us to do what Balaam could not. And that's to put to death those desires of our earthly nature. Because otherwise, we'll be consumed by them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this story of Balaam and the donkey and Balak and, and everything here. Lord, you've given us a, a very uh, good window into those things that often tend to get in our, our field of view. Lord, we, we, we admit too often we focus on that which will give us uh, you know, temporary pleasure or that which will maybe cause us to not have to deal with discomfort. Lord, sometimes we choose to, uh, to pass up opportunities to love one another, to help one another as we do this life. We recognize that, um, that there are things that are laid in each of our paths, and though they may be different, uh, they are things that are uh, trials and temptations in our lives that we often need others to help us to see. Help us not to look at that spiritual blindness any different than we would physical blindness, Lord, that there are things um, that we too in our own lives need addressing with. I think of the, of the, uh, the plank and uh, the speck and about our needs, our sensitivities need to be such that we are seeking to um, remove that plank, and yet we recognize that that plank cannot fully be removed without you, and it cannot fully be removed without the help of others. Lord, you have given us community for many reasons, but that's one of them, and it's, it's vital that we play that in each other's lives. I thank you for the gift of the story of Balaam's donkey and the reminder that you know we often look to those things that we classify as wise, things that we expect to hear from, and, and so when we hear from those areas or pl people or places where we think, that's just foolishness, and yet you use them, we recognize that sometimes out of those foolish places comes the very truth we need to hear. Help us to have ears to be sensitive and minds that are willing and hearts that are, are longing to be for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the closing benediction and our last song. May the strength of God sustain you. May the power of God preserve you. May the hands of God protect you. May the way of God direct you. And may the love of God go with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Remember, church, we are sent.